Lou Reed was a rock and roll bad boy. He abused drugs and alcohol, trashed hotel rooms, cursed at reporters and engaged in bar brawls. Reed was also different. Where most rockers had affairs with supermodels, Reed opted for trysts with transvestites. While typical pop stars sang about how much they missed old girlfriends, Reed sang about bondage and sadomasochism in Venus and Furs. Google the words Lou Reed and you'll find dozens of incidents describing his brutal, selfish, misanthropic behaviour. There was the time he slapped David Bowie after Bowie suggested Reed cut back on his drug and alcohol use, or the time he called Bob Dylan a pretentious kike. Reed himself was Jewish. Before his anti-authority attitude became a staple of his performances, a young Lou Reed mastered the art of the prima donna rock star at Syracuse University. As a budding frontman for his band LA and the El Dorados, Reed once refused to play a frigid outdoor gig aboard a boat on the St. Lawrence River. He punctuated his disapproval by smashing his guitar playing hand through a plate glass door. He just didn't want to play, said Richard Mishkin, a 1965 SU alumnus who played bass in the El Dorados. We had to take him to the ER and I told him, Lou, you play guitar like shit anyways. And he played the show. Reed's classmates at Syracuse University, a place that would shape the rock legend, remember him for his individual spirit and refusal to fit in with the mainstream. Mishkin met Reed when he still went by Lewis in October of Reed's first semester on campus through a mutual friend, Alan Hyman, who grew up just down the street from the future rock star in Freeport. Hyman and Reed, friends since third grade who first visited campus together in the fall of 1958, were looking for a bassist, so Mishkin set aside his impression of Reed's intentionally off putting persona and joined LA and the El Dorados. Lou was a prick, he said. He's not the kind of guy who would be nice to people in most circumstances. Often the bandmate tasked with getting Reed out of bed at 10 a.m. on gig days, Mishkin hauled LA and the El Dorados around in an enormous white Chrysler boasting huge tail fins and painted with bright red guitars and the band's name. Reed was a massively influential artist who would go on to form the Velvet Underground, a band whose music inspired everyone from David Bowie to Sonic Youth, not long after graduating from Syracuse University in 1964. His avant-garde songwriting earned him the nickname The Godfather of Punk, a name Reed despised despite his influence on the emergent 1970s genre. As lead singer and songwriter for the Velvet Underground and a renowned solo artist, Lou Reed invented alternative rock. His music at once a source of transcendent beauty and coruscating noise, violated all definitions of genre while speaking to millions of fans and inspiring generations of musicians. He sang about scoring heroin in Harlem, hung out with Andy Warhol at the factory and inspired generations of punk bands that went on to rage at the CBGB. Lou Reed was as New York as Yankee Stadium and his best songs continue to inspire. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to remember this if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content. But as revealed in the new book, Lou Reed, A Life by Anthony D. Curtis, the day-to-day -day of Reed, who died in 2013 at age 71, was gritty, unpredictable, and sometimes tragic or beautiful, just like the narratives of his best songs. Lou became identified as a figure who did whatever he wanted, said to Curtis. He wasn't dictated to. The easiest way to lose Lou was to set expectations. Reed was born in Brooklyn, grew up on Long Island, and received electroshock therapy as a teenager. He never forgave his parents for putting him through it. On the upside, the treatment allowed Reed to claim mental illness, which got him out of living in the dorms at Syracuse University, where he was an English major. Sharing a pigsty apartment littered with the shells of pistachios that Reed ate obsessively, he could freely bring home sexual conquests and indulge in drugs. After graduating, Reed moved to New York, where in 1964, 
He helped found the Velvet Underground, a band whose early shows included a gymnasium emptying gig at Summit High School in New Jersey and another for a Manhattan convention for psychiatrists. After six years, four albums and one engineer who abandoned a recording session saying, you can't pay me enough to listen to this crap, Reed, then 28, left the band. He moved home to Long Island and worked at his dad's accounting firm. Yes, briefly Reed was on track to become a boring bean counter from the Burbs. But he was saved by David Bowie, a diehard Velvets fan, who produced Reed's biggest hit, Walk on the Wild Side, and the 1972 album Transformer. Reed paid Bowie back by blatantly planting a kiss on the British rocker's lips during a press conference. Reed was never shy about his sexual proclivities, which included a year-long relationship in the mid-1970s with a transgender woman named Rachel. Reed met her while in the midst of a three-day methamphetamine bender, and she was sometimes spotted with a bruised face and blackened eyes. A friend likens their troubled relationship to a marriage maid in the emergency room. Reed enjoyed picking up cross-dressing hookers in the pre-gentrified meatpacking district and interviewing them about unprintable sex acts. According to the book, an all-male S&M club called The Anvil ranked among the rockers' personal favourites. By the time Reed hit his 40s, nights of drinking, drugging and carousing had gotten the better of him and his liver. He sobered up, bought a house in rural Blairstown, New Jersey and shot a Honda scooter commercial. Reed and avant-garde musician Laurie Anderson became an unlikely husband and wife. They met in 1992 at a performance by saxophonist John Zorn and Reed lived out his last two decades as a somewhat tamed elder statesman, complete with Tai Chi and a rigorous diet. Despite all his success and notoriety, however, Reed's most outrageous moments, including racist and rude proclamations that stick around in print and online, dogged him. He remembered every interview he had done, how high he was, how out of control he was, says to Curtis. Although the Velvet Underground never achieved commercial success during the 1960s, their influence on music in later decades was widely recognised. The glam punk and alternative rock movements of the 1970s, 80s and 90s were all indebted to Reed, whose songs were covered by the likes of R.E.M., Bowie, Nirvana, Patti Smith, and countless others. Music producer Brian Eno once summed up their influence by saying, The first Velvet Underground album only sold 10,000 copies, but everyone who bought it formed a band. The group were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1996. As a solo artist, Reed released 20 studio albums. His last, Hudson River, Wind, Meditations, was released in 2007. His dying peacefully with a deep archive that would go to the New York Public Library may be the biggest shocker of all, but it's probably fitting. The man who once released Metal Machine Music, a double album comprised of amplifier feedback, would find it appealing to confound expectations to the end. Now it's time to hear from you. Do you have a favourite Lou Reed song that you like the most or perhaps a moment in his career that you remember the most? Let us know in the comments below and if you haven't already done so, click the bell icon to stay updated on all of our latest content.